Good evening, everybody. It is Thursday, October 14th, 2021, and the time is 6.30 p.m. This is a regular scheduled meeting of the Burnsville Egan Savage Independent School District 191. Welcome to all those in attendance and those watching at home. Thank you for joining us this evening. Director Hume, will you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Thank you. We will begin tonight's meeting with the approval of tonight's agenda. If I could have a motion for that, please. So moved. Moved by Director Hume. And second. Second. Seconded by Director Werb. Uh, all those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, indicate by saying nay. Hearing none, the motion passes unanimously. So we will now move to the information section of our meeting. To begin with, uh, we will have receive a report about additional federal funding. Coming to the microphone is our well, speaker, will be Dr. Teresa Battle, superintendent, and coming to the microphone, Lisa Ryder, executive director of business services. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Miller and directors of the board. Tonight, uh, Lisa Ryder and I will share information regarding the latest allocations we have received um, from federal funding that came to the state um, and Governor Walls has made some decisions as well as Minnesota Department of Education. And so tonight we'll share the additional federal funding we have received. Um, you have a list of these new allocations. First one is homeless two, COVID-19 testing, part B 611 for special education, part B 619 for our three to five year olds receiving special education and the pandemic enrollment loss to offset the enrollment loss that districts um, experiences due to the pandemic. I, I would like you to note that on many of the slides in tonight's presentation, we are yet to determine the uses. MDE is still providing guidance for appropriate uses and components of each application. Just today, MDE held a webinar and provided a 54 slide presentation for the homeless um, to funding. So that tells you the level of detail that Congress is expecting, as well as our state is expecting uh, for details uh, regarding these allocations. So now I'll turn it over to Lisa Ryder to share more details about uh, what is known about these federal funding allocations. Thank you, Dr. Battle. Uh, included in the slideshow is a graph that has been used by Minnesota Department of Education to identify the various different types of funding and their purposes throughout um, the three different um, laws that were signed, uh, resulting in the aids and the grants that we see coming towards us. So what we've done is we've highlighted four of these boxes in yellow. You see them on the right-hand side of the page. And those are four of the five that we're gonna talk about today as to where they're coming from. So as we start, um, the one that is not shown on the page there is the COVID-19 testing, and we'll talk about that one in a moment. Okay, so the Homeless 2 grant, as Dr. Battle mentioned today, was the day for them to disclose um, much of the details. We know it was a continuation of the Homeless 1 grant we had received, and yet um, I did learn today that that goes now through 2024. And so September of 2024. So we have some time to utilize these funds for our homeless students who are in need. Um, the exact purpose of how we will spend that is yet to be determined as we have not yet crafted our, our um, plan for this as we just are learning yet some information. Next, we have our COVID-19 testing grant. Um, this one is uh, 467,479 and 59 cents made available to us through the, um, this is a, a decision um, 
it's not a part of the serves is what I'm trying to say. It's not the ARP funding either. So the COVID-19 testing kind of comes separately and it's it, the whole intent of course is to expand on that testing program within our schools. And so this grant we have um, submitted our application and the budget as of today. And so we do know that that will be spent largely on testing kits as well as um, three additional nurses that we're contracting for. Uh, the next um, item is part B611. So the, this one and the next slide are all around special education. And in our normal year without the ARP funding, SR1, SR2, any of that, we usually do receive federal funds for special education students. Um, that is called part B611. So now there is a subset of the ARP funds, the American Rescue Plan funds, that is dedicated and allocated through the IDEA program, which is the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. So a portion of it is to be used as typically the Part B611 funds are used. That is pretty much generally special education, but they are federal funds. And so that's $435,427. And the next slide is the portion that is for the preschool incentive ages three to five, also for special education. And that is $36,589. So again, those two are above and beyond our typical federal funds, but are allocated through the ARP programming. Next, we have our pandemic enrollment loss. This was recently disclosed as to our allocation and um, 191's allocation is 621846 The intention behind this revenue is it's meant to replace the loss of revenue that we, we experienced as a result of a drop of enrollment from fiscal year 20 to fiscal year 21. So it's based on the, the loss from the prior year. We're going to receive the funds, though, in this current year, FY22, and those funds come through the flexible state fiscal stabilization funds in the American Rescue Plan. So this was a decision by the governor as to how to utilize the, the portion of funds that they had to um, offset this negative impact we've had on our revenue as a result of enrollment losses across the state. The funds are determined by formula as to how they would be distributed. And as I said, they will be distributed during this year. We are um, still working on exactly how we will utilize those funds in our budget, and that will be coming forward with more information as we, as we come to that. So our next steps with all of these, on top of the other grants that we have shared with you previously, we're going to review the appropriate uses for each of these funding sources and make sure that our, the data that we have also about our needs are, uh, is addressed, right? So in part of our process is just identifying what are those needs and as we learn more as the year goes on we want to make sure we're making they're utilizing those funds for those purposes we also want to vet the use of these funds through our COVID-19 leadership team and we'll present that those uses to the Board of Education and we'll be submitting applications as they're required to be submitted and keep you informed of those I thank you that concludes our report. Thank you. I will open it up to questions from the board members. Any questions or comments? Yep. Director Alt. Thank you, Lisa. Um, just a couple of questions. Um, I'm imagining, knowing there's so much that's still to be determined, as mentioned, Dr. Battle, in, in your portion of the report. We'll start um, getting um, brush strokes of that uh, when we start the next budget cycle, correct? And likely also as we revise our current year budget. Yep. So it's, some of the funds will be utilized um, sooner than later. We know that we're intending to utilize the ESSER two funds this year. Um, and so ESSER three would be planned for the next subsequent two years. However, some of these grants will begin right away. And I guess the one thing that jumped out at me was, you know, the, the funding for the homeless students. And 
I'm, I'm guessing that we probably won't delay necessarily on using those funds for the homeless students. We have just wrapped up the use and the obligation of funds through September 30th for $75,000. That was the homeless one. So we will follow with whatever um, additional needs that there may be utilizing <laughs> the homeless two grants. We just need to get the process. You can't draw funds down until you have completed the budget process with those funds. Got it. Um, and then, sorry. Um, so in terms of, I know in the last, I think it was in our last board meeting when we received information about COVID funding, um, it, there was, we had a discussion about the fact that um, there's a you know document that clearly earmarks staffing that's, that's being funded through COVID. Um, so that we're able to track, you know, exactly which position is is has been wholly or partly funded by by COVID, and I guess um, it probably will be helpful for the board to be able to see that same tracking, so that we can understand exactly what the yeah. FTE are that um, that are technically ours to keep versus those that um, might be temporary, at least um, in the short term. Is yeah. that is that? So, so all of these grants that you've heard of today are going to be additional above and beyond, not necessarily utilizing or supplanting any other funds. Um, so those will have their own unique codes and we will use the right finance dimensions to track those. With regard to ESSER II, a portion of ESSER II funds are being used for some of the existing programs and staffing that we have coming into this year. And so they will have the proper finance dimension on, on allocated for those staff members. Um, and then everything that's additional above and beyond, as we have talked about, those are also allocated to a different budget unit entirely and still also with the right proper finance dimension. So I think you'll, you'll find that when we look at the revised budget, you'll see how, how that's being separated and, and tracked. And with that, with, um, the, I'm hearing you say you'd like to see the FTEs as well with those. If, where it's, because these are, in my mind, a one-time, you know, kind of a one-time deal. Hopefully, right. a one-time deal. Right. Um, so we want to make sure that we're not adding ongoing expenses. Um, yeah. Right. That obligates us for the future. Yep, I hear you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Okay, great. Yep. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Any other board member? Yeah. Um, for the COVID-19 testing, what happens if we run over because we need more testing, or what happens if there's less testing needed? Yeah. Hopefully, that'll come. But... Right. I mean, the funds that when you do a grant, if you don't use the funds, then you don't draw them down. Okay. That's how the federal grants work. So we will only use that which we need. If there's a greater need than what we have available to us, I think we would want to look at the other state resources that are available with other testing sites and directing people to those locations if that should be necessary. So we still get the funds, though, even if we don't use it? Do we get to? No. Nope. Oh, we just don't. So with federal funds, we, they're allocated to us. Yep. They're set aside for us. But we can't draw them down unless we have expended the money <clears throat> to use those funds. Gotcha. Thank you. Yep. Question, Lisa. Um, going back to the homelessness um, funding or money, you said the first part needs to be, you, you gave a deadline or a timeline on, the, on that. What is the timeline for the second one? So the first one needed to be obligated by September 30th of this year. The second homeless two grant mm -hmm. is not uh, required to be obligated until September of 2024. So we have more time with that particular grant. All right. Thank you. Yes. Mm -hmm. Additional questions or comments? Yes, go ahead. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I forgot one. Um, I guess I, I also wanted to just um, thank Dr. Battle and um, the team. I know, you know, I, I've been reading in the news that outside of Minnesota, there have been concerns about how COVID funding is being spent. And I do appreciate um, all of the level of detail and transparency that, that you and your team are bringing so that the board and our community can, can be reassured that you know, the funding that we're receiving from the feds and from the state are truly going uh, right to right to the students and to the programs where it, where it rightly should, as well as mitigation. Thank you for that. 
Yeah, thank you uh, for that presentation. And actually, uh, Director Earl kind of touched on the thing I wanted to mention is that uh, I do also pre deeply appreciate the um, frequency of these reports we've been receiving and the transparency. Um, you know, even a slide that says we still don't quite understand this stuff and but we're not unpacking it tells us something and tells the community something that we are involved in it. We know we're looking into it. So I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, next, we are going to move under our information part of our meeting to receive an update about District 191's efforts to implement COVID-19 related educational and public health guidance issued by the MDE and the MDH respectively. Speaking on this matter will be Dr. Teresa Battle, our superintendent. Dr. Thank you, Chair Miller, directors of the board. Joining me for tonight's report is uh, Bernie Bean, our lead licensed school nurse. Uh, Bernie will share health data for Dakota Scott counties uh, as well as Minnesota and our district data and then I will cover a few topics um, related to COVID-19 response implementation. Bernie. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Miller, <laughs> Dr. Battle, Chair Miller and Board of Directors. So I'm going to share with you some of the data that we have in Minnesota and our counties and in our school district. So we still are in a high transmission rate for our, our district um, and our counties. Dakota County's rate is 244.04, which is last week it was 251, so it has gone down a little bit. Um, they're saying that they're seeing kind of what I would call a sawtooth pattern. It goes up a little bit, it comes down a little bit. So kind of, of a plateau of a number. Their seven-day rolling count of positive cases for Dakota County has also come down from 154 to 150 this week. 41% of the cases in Dakota County that are positive are in individuals the ages of 30 to 39. 20% of the cases for all children were in children under age 12, so 20% of the cases. Last, time at, last year at this time, that percentage was 5%. So that is a significant um, change from last year. Scott County, their case rate is 290, and they too feel that they may be starting to see a little plateauing and, and coming down with their numbers. But the positivity rate for Minnesota for September 26 to October 2nd was 7.8, which is up from the prior week. According to the CDC site for today, the positivity rate for both Dakota County and Scott County are up. Dakota County is 7.67. Scott County is 9.51. Internally, for our cases of positive individuals that were infectious in our building, since August 23rd, we have 71 cases. As far as investigations, two weeks ago, we completed 24. Last week, 15. And this week, so far, we're at six. As of today, 240 students are out due to the effects of quarantine or isolation. Vaccination rates continue to creep up a little bit. Our 12 to 15-year-olds in Dakota County are now at 65% for at least one dose. We continue to partner with our community to provide options for families and community members to receive vaccination. This last month, Burnsville High School hosted a vaccine clinic with partnership with Dakota County Public Health. And tomorrow, the Burnsville Alternative High School will also be hosting a clinic. Nation nationally, the vaccine committee met today with FDA to discuss the Moderna booster for individuals who have completed that first series. And on October 26, that vaccine committee will also be discussing an an expansion of the emergency use authorization for Pfizer to children between the ages of 5 and 11. As far as saliva screening, as um, Lisa Ryder talked, we are working on the optional saliva screening for staff, which would be similar to what we did last year with the vault screening and um, offering that more often every week to staff members. We're working on securing those test kits for them. Student testing. Um, I really think this shows how our community partners have stepped up to help us. Our Dakota Child and Family Clinic in Burnsville 
continues to offer an as needed saliva, an as needed um, COVID testing site for our students as we refer them when they're in our health office. This week they have expanded that so if their siblings in the car and we pre-register them, all the siblings can be tested at the same time, which makes it so much more convenient for families. And our hope is that we will be able to roll that out to students that are homesick also as, that, as we continue to expand that service. So today, um, I was looking at the data and wondering really what does it mean to us? Um, you know, we don't have a, it's more difficult this year to tease out comparisons to other districts. So I reached out to Bianca Vernick, who is our regional support individual, and she reached out to MDH. And I received this, this email today from the epidemiology department. First off, I'd like to applaud you for your efforts to follow the guidance that MDH CDC has provided. We do believe it's making a difference in your school district, as your case numbers are definitely, definitely low compared to most other schools in the metro. In particular, you don't appear to have any clusters or outbreaks in any of your schools, and it sounds like your follow-up has been manageable, which is not the same in other schools. I would definitely continue what you are doing to keep kids safe, as it all matters, and is helping to keep their kids in school rather than have them to move to classrooms, from classrooms to distance learning, as others have done following classroom transmission. With that, I, we, um, I want to thank our district. I want, it's not been easy. And when we're investigating multiple cases a day, that's tough. And it has called upon other disciplines besides health to step up and be a part of this. It's been, um, it's, it's been an interesting year. The hard decisions as a board that you've had to make, Dr. Battle, I'm here to tell you it is working. Our priority is health and safety for our students and our community, and we are doing that. Thank you. Thank you for that, Bernie. Um, I think we're experiencing some COVID exhaustion. Um, I don't think any of us thought we would be in the place where we are when we're in high transmission. And so I really want to thank uh, the board, our staff members in the community for sticking with us. It has been very difficult, but I'm hoping that we'll uh, see some changes in the confirmed cases shortly. Um, wanted to share a little bit about what we know about vaccination percentages for staff. Um, we have a record, we can uh, say we have 63% of the 989, 191 employees covered under our health plan that have been vaccinated. This likely does not reflect all employees that have been vaccinated. Not all employees qualify for insurance. Some may be on other health plans, and some may have been vaccinated through clinics that were free or at no cost and did not request medical insurance information. Considering these factors, as Bernie shared earlier, Dakota County is at 65% for uh, 12 and up for a first dose. So we think we're pretty similar, as I just shared, 63%. So um, Minnesota Department of Health and Minnesota Department of Education are working on a, a more uh, easier way for districts to find out the status of employees' vaccination. You do, we do need consent to find out an employee's vaccination status. So they had proposed one option through the mix system that they would get our employees consent, but they're still under discussion. We were hopeful at the nurses meeting yesterday they would have more information, but they still haven't provided information. So we can get it from our health uh, information. Um, the other update is about the testing grant. Um, just wanna emphasize the allocation that Lisa shared earlier 
Uh, we really want to continue that partnership with Dakota Child and Family Clinic. We think it's a great benefit for our families. So we're in the process to see if they need additional staffing to help support us. So that may be one uh, position we would fund. We are funding three contracted nurses. As Bernie uh, shared, uh, investigations and contact tracing takes uh, quite a bit of time. And as you know, our nurses are also seeing the normal everyday student reasons to come to the nurse. A uh, strep throat is still here, so strep throat, those normal things. And so we're really looking to have those uh, three contracted nurses to help support them. And then Bernie also mentioned the testing through vault. Uh, Stephanie White, who was our previous uh, director of student support service, did survey staff um, to see their interest in weekly testing. And then there's a plan to poll families and students to also see their interest in weekly testing. Uh, now to some instructional news. In light of Minnesota schools transitioning to distance learning due to COVID-19 spread, we are very fortunate we have not had to close a school or move the students to distance learning, not close a school, but move students to distance learning. So we have been developing a plan just in case we need to move to distance learning. So I'm asking families to please look for an email, a district email that will share information about what would happen if schools need to transition to distance learning. Uh, the email will give specific um, plans for elementary, middle, <coughs> our Burnsville High School, Burnsville Alternative High School, and BEST program. But overall, blended learning plans have been established for pre-K-12 as a short-term response. We are working on individual students to have a daily check-in and support with assignments and materials posted by classroom teachers. And for a classroom or site, if we have to have a classroom move to online learning with the classroom teacher providing both synchronous and asynchronous instruction. Next note is about operations. On October 1st, Minnesota Department of Education shared information about food and nutrition. As some of you have heard in the news, we're experiencing a bit of a supply chain issue. And so MDE wanted to share that nationwide, the manufacturing and distribution industry is experiencing severe staffing and labor shortages, as well as rising costs of materials and transportation. We have sent a notice to families to anticipate that our menu choices may be impacted. They also have allowed the federal government have given us uh, waivers for uh, trying to address working in a different way to get produce and other items we need. And so I just ask parents as well as students to be patient with us that you may not always see the uh, food that you're expecting whether it's breakfast or lunch. Also, MDE shared information regarding meals for students that are on quarantine or learning from home uh, due to COVID-related closures or isolation or quarantine. So we are expected to provide access to meals. And so we have been developing a 191 plan to have our 191 community pantry option. So this is through community education where families would get one bag per family and that would be five school days of breakfast and lunch meals. 10 meals designed to serve a family of four. Most meals will require some prep such as uh, peanut butter and jelly with bread to make a sandwich or you have to open and heat soup in a microwave. We will continue to look for the prepackaged meal options for the long, long term, which uh, can use food services money as meals are, would be reimbursable. So that's one of the options they've given us. Uh, we hope to have the meal pickup plan finalized by next week. It may be at Metcalf, but we still have to work out a few details. And that concludes our COVID-19 report for tonight. 
Thank you. <clears throat> I'll open it up for uh, questions or comments from board members. Uh, I just have a question about mm -hmm. the, the meals. Um, will those be covered under the free meals? I'm going to ask uh, Lisa Ryder to come up and answer that question. So the meals that um, we would be preparing under the Pantry 191 model do not have the meal pattern that is required for reimbursement through the federal um, summer or seamless summer meal program that we're otherwise functioning under. So that instead would need to be paid for out of the ESSER two funds for the product itself. And then we would be distributing that through our uh, collaboration, hopefully through Open Door, as we already have that happening for our community. This would be an expansion for the families that are in need of food. Okay, thank you. Yep. No questions or comments. Yes. I was just curious, maybe Bernie can answer this. Since we're offering COVID vaccines, have we thought about offering um, flu shots or? Just curious. No. Okay. <laughs> no, we have not. Um, okay. Yeah. Just. Sorry. But we sure should, uh, we sure can um, publicize the Dakota County and the Scott County flu clinics that are open to the community. That's a great suggestion. And I know that um, we're planning for meals to be picked up by families. Uh, what about families with issues um, accessing transportation? So thank you for that question, Director Alt. Members of the board, as you know, uh, previously, families could call in and contact us if they could not come to the pickup. So uh, Lisa, do you wanna share uh, our discussions? I think it's a capacity issue. As you know, we're having difficulty with transportation with drivers. So if you, we are trying to figure out a way, but I'll get, have Lisa give some more detail. We encourage any family that is going to have difficulty in b being able to pick up food and is in need of food to contact us so we're aware of their concern and need. Um, at the same time, we're going to do the best we can to serve them. At this point, it's in preliminary stance as to who exactly would be able to serve. Um, as Dr. Battle mentioned, we do have a shortage of drivers and we have um, that limitation as well. So we'll have to figure that piece out. But I think that with the collaboration, the connections we have within our community, we'll do the best we can. Yeah, I'll just, I mean, um, I assume there's no barriers to us to help on that, right? So, um, I mean, I'm, I'm sure there is a cadre of retired pers people out there that maybe want to, would love to deliver meals or whatever it might be. And if those opportunities are made available, we would take advantage of that, correct? Um, if, if anyone wants to volunteer for a particular role, please reach out to us. Yes, absolutely. Um, at the same time, the, uh, you know, the, our approach is also to involve known partners that we already have, too, in the community. So we'll, we'll continue to do that. And I know in the past, Open Door has been able to have enough volunteers to allow for some delivery of some meals. So that might be our, our first avenue of choice. And they may very well be able to volunteer through that organization as well. Well, just a follow up question on the, um, I guess I wasn't, I was under the impression that all of our routes are fully um, staffed with bus drivers. Yes, but they're using some of the subs too. Lisa, you wanna share details? So yes, we're covered, but we had a difficulty with subs. So, so in the past, when you've had these meals that needed to be delivered, that has been additional routes that were, were um, created and then staffed with additional drivers. Um, we are using all of the available drivers for our current routes. And so the challenge would be, are there any available to be able to do something like that midday or end of day, some type of, something like that. So we'll look into it. It's, it is about the need. So if somebody has a need, please contact us so that we can make sure we're meeting those needs. And I know Schmitty has been a great partner. So, you know, having those conversations, you know, we can always be hopeful. Yep. Yep. Thank you. Just for a clarification, you said contact us. For the families who do not know what that means or where to contact, can you please provide that? 
Sure. Um, so they can certainly contact the Food and Nutrition Extension at 2051. 2051, and they will be able to reach the receptionist through the Food and Nutrition Department who can make sure that they are on our list. Thank you. Yep. Uh, Director Saeed and directors of the board, once we have the meal uh, plan finalized for those students who are quarantined, we'll make sure we include all that information. We want to work out these last few details before we start to communicate. I really do appreciate that because we all know hunger in our students is real and it's there. And we all understand that we don't want to change it and make it more difficult for them to get that assistance and help because of shortage of workers or whatever the case might be. So thank you. One more question. Yep, go ahead. Um, so at this time, the only location would be Metcalf? Uh, we're not sure yet. Okay. Just wanted the details. Okay. All right. <laughs> Metcalf is a great possibility. Um, as you know, it's been used for uh, other uses in the pandemic too. And Open Door currently is leasing it. So they would have their volunteers there. And so we just need to finalize that partnership. My, my concern is just that, you know, having more than one option for locations. Mm -hmm. Other questions or comments? I had a question um, back to the uh, staff vaccination rates. Um, just help me understand, um, Dr. Bell, you alluded to uh, limitations of um, privacy, and I fully appreciate and understand that. Um, I'm fairly certain I listened to a radio news story about, I believe it was Rochester School District, that was able to report on vaccination rates among um, the staff, even at like a building level. And I think they mentioned something about pulling county or state data. They weren't giving individual, you know, re, you know, this person, that person, but it was a, it was like a percentage of buildings or something like that. It, it, did I misunderstand that, or is there is there an opportunity we could do something like that to get a little bit more detailed information? Mm -hmm. uh, Chair Miller, directors of the board, I'm not familiar with that example, um, but I think we could get some more information. I uh, will ask um, Executive Director Stacy Sovine if our health uh, partners could provide that data, and hopefully we'll have some more information from Minnesota Department of Health and MDE about how they're going to assist us. So as you know, with President Biden's um, order, employers have uh, needed access. And so they've been working with the Minnesota Department of Health, how they could streamline for them to get the list of vaccinated employees. And so that was the first uh, model they've used in the state. And they're hoping they can help us if we need the same type of information. Thank you. I, I, you know, I think it's important. We're, you know, people understand this is not a investigative process for us. It, but as you alluded to, there is an ongoing conversation about where we're headed with vaccinations and the requirement of vaccinations, and that's working its way through the review and legal understanding and such. This board might be faced with having a very serious conversation about that in the future, and framing that with understanding what is the reality of the world we exist in right now will help out. Um, if we know a percentage number, that might make a big impact on where we, how we look at that problem and that, that conversation, so it will help immensely. Uh, the only other thing I wanted to mention was, um, Bernie, you read a, a moving statement. Uh, I think you said it was from MDH or uh, anyway. Um, and I appreciate you bringing that to our attention. Um, uh, and you use that to thank the district and I appreciate that. Uh, frankly though, to be honest, it's the district that owes you and your staff a thanks, not the other way around. I mean, everybody's involved, I understand that. But your, your, your organization has done such an amazing job. You alluded to challenging or hard decisions we had to make at this table. And yes, they were challenging and they, they were decisions we spent a lot of time thinking about, but at the end of the day, they frankly were easy decisions because you made them easy. So I appreciate that very much. Thank you. Thank you. But it is all of us. We are, from the parents that are 
keeping their children home when they're sick, from staff that are going above their normal activities to teach in a mask, um, to our custodians who are doing more cleaning for us, our kitchen staff that are cooking foods in different ways, um, not to minimize any role, but it truly is, our district is 191. We are working together. We're showing that how strong a community can be when we do this and keep health and safety in perspective. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, we will now move on to our student representative report um, given by uh, our student representative, uh, Ms. Zoe Olson. So listen, the microphone is yours. Thank you. It has, been an, an, it has been an eventful month as students have participated in many school activities and have had a great experience while doing so. Although some aspects of school have looked a bit different this year, I've heard from countless students that it is very nice to be back in person, and most students would agree that being in person has been much better than last year when most students were virtual or hybrid. Um, students feel they are gaining a lot more from being in person, um, both learning and with the, all the extracurricular activities that they've been able to participate in. Um, this past month has been very busy with lots of different activities. Um, homecoming week took place the week of September 20th. Um, homecoming royalty was coordinated at the Monday morning Pep Fest assembly. Student groups such as Burnsville Swing, Drumline, Blazettes, and Choir performed at the assembly, showing off their hard work um, to the seniors that viewed the, the assembly in person, as well as the rest of the students who watched it uh, live from their classrooms. Students celebrated school spirit throughout the week by participating in various theme days, such as Blaze Day, Pajama Day, Jersey Day, Tropical Day, and college day. Students also had the opportunity to attend the powder puff football game. Um, Wednesday night we were supposed to have a movie night but um, the outdoor screen was not working. We are going to reschedule that for later in this later the school year. Um, many students attended the homecoming football game on Friday night where uh, the homecoming royalty was recognized during the halftime show. And then the week wrapped up on Saturday night with Burnsville High School's first ever outdoor homecoming dance. Um, it was, <laughs> it turned out very well um, with good weather and I talked to a lot of students who thought that, who said that they thought the dance went better than they expected it to be and was more fun than they anticipated it would be. Um, so our members of student council did a great job in planning, decorating, and spreading the word about all of these um, activities. Uh, homecoming week in general, I think, was a good representation of how the school year has been going so far. Um, it was different, and in some ways it was more challenging, but uh, students who participated had a lot of fun and gained a lot from those experiences and found it to be pretty successful. Other school activities have been also um, in full gear since the beginning of the school year. Um, there was an outdoor band concert on the football field uh, a couple weeks ago, something that has not happened in the past. There have also been orchestra and choir concerts recently. Many fall sports are nearing the end of their seasons if they haven't already um, wrapped up their seasons. Uh, they participated in section competitions and recognized their senior players. And other activities, uh, like academic activities like speech and debate, have been recruiting new members as they begin their seasons. Green Apple Day of Service took place on October 2nd, uh, where various students and student groups came together to clean up the Burnsville High School campus outside um, as a part of a national day of service. And then uh, on Monday, this past Monday evening, the Burnsville National Honor Society had their induction ceremony um, where over 150 students were recognized for their dedication to the four pillars of NHS, which are scholarship, leadership, service, and character. 
Um, BHS students have gotten back into the swing of learning as classes have um, ramped up. This week was this, and next week are very popular weeks to have tests and quizzes as students have been finishing up some of their first units of the year. Um, and yesterday was a virtual day for all of the seniors and some of the 11th graders as the 9th and 10th graders took the pre-ACT and the 11th graders took the PSAT. Uh, seniors and some 11th graders were able to continue their classes asynchronously while the other students had the opportunity to practice for those important college entrance exams. Um, all in all, the school year has been off to a very good and busy start. And although some things look a little bit different, students have been able to learn and participate um, in all the things that our school has to offer. And with that, I conclude my report. Thank you. Uh, any questions or comments for our student representative? No, none? Uh, thank you, and I, I think we would be remiss to not point out, I'm sure, and Ms. Olson, you would not do this on your own, but I think we acknowledge the fact that I believe you were a recipient of a pretty high award or honor, is that correct? Congratulations to you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for making Burnsville popular. National strong, Merit semi-finalist. Yes. 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 Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, national Merit. Yes, and a semi, you know, she's in the running for National Merit, right? Uh, yeah, um, I am a National Merit Scholar semi-finalist. Awesome. Very good. Okay. Well done. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we will move uh, to our superintendent's report. Mass difficulty here, just a moment. <laughs> okay, thank you, Chair Miller and members of the board. Tonight, I would like to highlight a story that's on our website right now that I think speaks to the kind of students we have in our schools and the kind of community we are. You will see some photos of these wonderful students. The board and others may know that the Where Everybody Belongs or web program at Nicolette and Eagle Ridge Middle Schools is a student-led program where eighth graders are mentors for younger students, especially sixth graders. These older students help with simple things like getting lockers open and finding classrooms, but they also help with more complicated things like team building and facilitating discussions in advisory classes. Student web leaders played an especially important role on the first day of the year, welcoming sixth graders and helping them feel comfortable in a new school. Right from the first day, they were building a positive school culture and setting a great example, and they continue to do so every week. The story that's on our website, though, is only tangentially about the web program. It's really an introduction to these wonderful eighth grade student leaders. Leaders like Justin Ramirez at Eagle Ridge, who shared that being in front of large groups as a web leader has helped him grow more confident. He says he knows the younger kids look up to him, so he tries to be a good role model. And leaders like Bailey Fox at Nicolette who shared what she learned during first day activities. She said, not fitting in or just being uncomfortable with who they are is something I notice about some students. I try to connect with those students and just listen to them. By just listening to them and their feelings, I feel like I'm supporting them and showing that someone cares or Eagle Ridge leader, Jennifer Saidu, who said, one thing I tell the sixth graders is that you're gonna go through ups and downs, especially with friends, and things might be challenging at times, but you will get through it. Keep an open mind and keep yourself open to other people. That's being a leader, and I would say sage advice from such young people that adults should adhere to. So these leaders are creating an environment where everyone can be successful. I'm so very proud of these students and the impact they are having now and the difference it will make for themselves and others for years to come. I encourage everyone to find that story 
or watch it for or watch for it on social media or in your email to get to know more of our amazing web leaders. And that concludes my report for tonight. Thank you, Dr. Battle. <clears throat> Any uh, questions or comments for Dr. Battle before we proceed? Yes, go ahead, Director. Just one. Um, Dr. Battle, you reminded me of um, a conversation a long time ago that kind of stuck with me and, and it's kind of bubbled up that for our students to um, to be successful in the, the many different ways that they achieve success, um, we all have to hope that each student will have someone, and I know you've talked about this before, um, that we, you know, we keep our, our students, our kiddos out of, you know, slipping through the cracks when we know that every single one of our students has, has someone special, someone that they trust, that they can talk to. And it may be a staff member, it may be a peer, it may be one of these mentors. And we, you know, I appreciate the, the time and the investment on, on the part of our staff and the students because we'll never know really, you know, we, we only know that, the, that there has been an impact and I know there will be a positive impact. What it looks like for each student, we won't know. So I really appreciate this. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We'll now move to uh, board member reports. Uh, again, these are reports, not uh, committee or assignment reports, but uh, outside of activities outside of that scope. Any board member reports for tonight? Go ahead, Director Bird. Do I need to repeat it? You're okay. Okay. Just <laughs> Sorry. Um, trends were discussed to determine appropriate forecasting for premium, premium increases. Uh, review included claims over the past two years. Declining enrollment in the plan, which is impacted by declining student enrollment, is a, is a factor. And how claims <laughs> costs impacts overall premium and other fixed costs on the plan. Unpredictable factors such as COVID and rising inflation are other risk, fa risk factors to take into account. And that concludes my report. Thank you. Any other activities or reports to bring forward? Yes, Director Alt. Just a brief report. Uh, I was happy to attend another Hall of Fame award ceremony. Uh, I believe that was last week. This year we celebrated two classes of honorees, 2020 and 2021, given the cancellation of last year's ceremony. Alums ranged uh, from graduates in the late 1970s through the 1980s. Breadth of experience, gifts, and talents um, abounded. And thanks to the Hall of Fame board, including Director Hume, um, for all of their uh, year-long efforts to make the celebration happen again this year. This ends my report. Thank you. Any other? Okay. Well, that concludes the information portion of our agenda for this evening. We will now move to the business meeting portion, uh, beginning with our consent agenda. Although board action is required, it is generally unnecessary to hold discussion on these items. In the event a board member wishes to discuss an item, that item will be moved for separate consideration. This time I'll ask if there's any items on our consent agenda that a board member wishes to move out for separate consideration. Okay, seeing no requests for such, I will ask for a motion on our consent agenda this evening. So moved. Moved by Director Chester. Any second? Second. Seconded by Director Connor. Uh, all those in favor of tonight's consent agenda indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed indicate by saying nay. Hearing none, tonight's consent agenda passes unanimously. We'll now move then to new business for the evening. To begin, we will, uh, first item tonight is to adopt a resolution awarding the sale of bonds. Coming to the microphone is Lisa Ryder, Executive Director of Business Services. 
Thank you. This evening, we also have Matthew Hammer of Ellers Incorporated here with us so that he can um, describe for us some of the information from today as we did sell bonds. And before you tonight, you have a printed copy of the sale day report um, that was there available for you. It also has been loaded to the website as well for the public. Once um, Matthew's done, then I will read the recommendation for the um, item tonight. Matthew. Uh, good evening, Chair Miller, uh, board members, uh, uh, Dr. Battle. Um, my name is Matthew Hammer, and I'm uh, part of the finance uh, advisory team from Ellers that uh, has been working with the district a long time. Um, we did sell bonds, uh, a current refunding of the district's 2023 through 2030 um, maturities on their general obligation 2012A alternative facility bonds this morning. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to report that we had outstanding results. Um, we actually ended up going sub 1% this morning. Um, our low bidder was uh, Baird uh, with Red Bank out of New Jersey, and they offered a 0.99% interest rate, um, which is about 15 basis points better than we were anticipating um, last month during our pre-sale report. Um, so what that kind of means in overall figures, uh, we're looking at about just shy of a million dollars in um, future value savings um, that the district taxpayers will recognize over the next uh, number of years as part of uh, the refinancing this issue. Um, so that's really good news. That's about uh, $120,000 better than we were anticipating last month and interest rates have remained very, very low and we really picked a good day to be in the market, I think. We ended up with four bidders um, which we like to see at least three, um, and the winning bidder, like I said earlier, was Baird, um, and they ended up bidding with a, a large Sydney kit with Red Bank out of New Jersey. So with that, um, there's a lot of information in the report that, um, that uh, Lisa highlighted here, um, kind of gives you an executive summary, but that's the overall summary of the results that we had from this morning, and I can answer any questions folks have. We give it the motion though. Yep. Great. Um, so the recommendation is that the Board of Education adopts the formal resolution awarding the sale of general obligation alternative facilities refunding bonds series 2021A, fixing their form and specifications, directing their execution and delivery, providing for their payment and providing for the redemption of bonds refunded. Thank you. I will look for a motion on the recommendation in front of us, please. So moved. Uh, Director Alt. <laughs> and uh, second, please. Second. Second by Director Werb. Uh, now I will open it up for any questions or comments on the motion. Any? I think it's much needed news to hear. Um, and the fact that we're in a good standing and a good time to do this. And I think our community members are always looking for good news in that area. So thank you. Yes, Director Alt. So when this uh, came forward last month, uh, we had talked about our sum total um, over the last 10 or so years. Um, do we have that? <laughs> I did not bring that tonight. I'm so okay. sorry. I will get that, though, and I will put that out. That would be awesome. I, I think we've got, I mean, on my own, I did the math um, briefly before arriving tonight, and it, we're at least at $5 million. Yes. Um, I know that, um, and just hoping for us to be able to yeah, toot our horn a little bit with with the the refining free nine, resale of these bonds in a way that really gives back to the taxpayers. Um, we often, you know, talked again last month about, you know, schools are often asking for money, and here's our opportunity to give back, and 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 really glad that um, that we continue to have this opportunity. So thank you. Okay. Any other questions or comments? All right. Well, thank you. I, I, and I'd just like to acknowledge uh, Ellers and their, their assistance in this issue. We, you guys have been great partners. Thank you very much. Yeah, and thank you for the opportunity. And I, I just will say that I, I think uh, this, the work to get this from the point of getting to market is not insignificant. And I'd like to thank both uh, Dr. Battle and especially Lisa's team and, and all the greater team that, that helps us get um, from the point of getting the, the documents, the ratings, and all that stuff to get us to this point. So appreciate the opportunity, and thank you. Thank you. 
So we will uh, now take a, a vote on the motion in front of us. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Any in favor indicate by saying nay. Hearing none, the motion passes. Thank you. Uh, next on our new business agenda for tonight is to approve on a first reading basis changes to policy 604, instructional curriculum 6.1 or 612.1, Title I family engagement and policy 620, credit for learning. Speaking on this issue will be Amina Afedal, Director of Curriculum, Instruction and Assessment. Welcome. Thank you, Chair Miller, Superintendent Battle. Members of the board, I uh, have uh, three policies with uh, recommendations for some uh, revisions based on uh, the discussions from the policy review committee. Uh, the first one, 604 instructional curriculum, uh, we have added a requirement that uh, all of our programs include and support the culturally responsive instruction um, and reflect diversity, inclusion, and representation of multiple perspectives. And uh, really reflecting uh, our actual practices as we are developing and revising curriculum for our students. Um, it also brings it into alignment with policy 105, our equity and excellence policy. Um, we also uh, re have, are proposing to expand the requirement for college and career exploration. The state requires, uh, legislation requires that we begin in grade nine. And uh, because of our programming and our pathways program, we will begin that in uh, grade six as a formal um, component. Uh, policy 612 is our Title I family engagement. The, the, uh, substance of the policy remains the same. We uh, just, uh, based on our last um, meeting, we have been going through policies to remove deficit-based language and replacing it with asset-based language. And so that's the change that is here, um, uh, asking us to uh, include parents of students who have been historically underserved, students who are served by IEPs, and multilingual students. And that uh, just brings that positive um, view to uh, students that will be served by the Title I po uh, family engagement policy. Finally is uh, policy 620, credit for learning. Uh, we included a definition for weighted grades because weighted grades is uh, referenced in the policy but no definition was provided. So that has been added. And uh, we have updated the language from honors courses to um, identified rigorous courses uh, since many course titles don't include the word honors anymore. Uh, and then uh, the, substan the substantive change in that is adding language that is uh, um, called uh, credit by assessment, in which students are able to earn high school credits toward graduation through um, curriculum or activities that they participate in outside of the regular curriculum and outside of the school curriculum. And uh, the, the language asks that they are able to demonstrate their mastery of the Minnesota academic uh, standards through uh, either an exam or a portfolio that is uh, provided by the school district. And so my recommendation is that you uh, accept these for their first reading. Okay, uh, thank you. I'll, I'll actually, I, I'll read the actual recommendation. Approve on a first reading basis changes to policy 604 uh, instructional curriculum, 612.1 Title I Family Engagement, and 620 Credit for Learning. I'll take a motion for the recommendation in front of us. So moved. Moved by Director Hume and a second. Second. Seconded by Director Chester. I will open it up for any questions or comments on the motion that's in front of us. I just have a quick comment. Um, I just want to say, having read through these, um, thank you to you and to the members of the Policy Review Committee for doing this review, especially through the, the equity lens that I know we, this board has spent a lot of time talking about and making sure that it, it meets those ideals and the principles and that we're working towards our, right, our culturally proficient school system. So it really jumped out at me more so in this round of policies than some of the other ones that we've discussed. So I just wanted to say thank you. Any other questions or comments? Okay, seeing none, we'll vote on the motion in front of us. All those uh, approving uh, indicate by saying aye. 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 Uh, any uh, not approving to indicate by saying nay. Not hearing any, the motion passes. Thank you.
Great. Thank you. Next on our agenda is to uh, approve on a first reading basis changes to policy 504, student dress and appearance, and policy 506, student discipline. Bringing this uh, recommendation forward will be Brian Gersich, Assistant Superintendent. Welcome, Brian. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Dr. Battle, and members of the board. Uh, I am here with two uh, policies that have been reviewed, and I have some recommended changes from the policy committee. Uh, first up, on policy 504, which governs our student dress and appearance, there are a couple of changes there. Uh, the first one under section C1, which talks about inappropriate clothing, uh, recommending some wording changes. And again, it's, it's, it's interesting that Director Hume just talked about equity language, because that's what you're really seeing in the recommendations that we have here. Uh, changing from language that uh, is, is really seen as kind of targeting gender specific uh, kinds of, of inappropriate attire. So adjusting that a little bit without losing the spirit of what is what we're looking for as a part of that policy. And at the top of page two, 504-2, uh, this is something that our principals have been advocating for, uh, for similar, similar reasons, both uh, cultural and just the fact that this just doesn't seem to be problematic. And so that would be striking that it would no longer be inappropriate for students to be wearing hats, hoods, or other uh, headwear. And so again, that's, that, that comes at the recommendation of our principals who are, I think, looking to, uh, again, reduce something that they don't see as problematic and also, again, give some cultural uh, significant or uh, uh, acceptance to things like hooded sweatshirts. Uh, so, uh, policy 506, we have a few recommended changes that start, uh, excuse me, 506 uh, is our general student discipline policy. Uh, starting on page 506-6, so what you're going to see are a numbered series of numbered items uh, essentially what this is is a big list of unacceptable behaviors, and so that's the context for which we're looking at these changes. Uh, item 21 on page 506-6 is updating language to the new acceptable use policy, which was uh, approved by the board very recently. Uh, item 30, you'll notice some changes in language again, some, some language that's more uh, reflective of District 191 in our cultural proficiency language. And item 41 is rewording so that it does match similar language that is used in uh, policy 545, I'm sorry, 413, I'm going to try to go too quickly here, uh, which is our harassment and violence policy. And then the last change on 506 is on page 19, which is adding a cross-reference to our equity uh, policy 105. And so with that, uh, it is the recommendation for the board, uh, or our recommendation for the board is to approve on a first reading basis changes to policies 504, student dress and appearance, and 506, student discipline. Thank you. I will take a uh, motion for the recommendation in front of us. So moved. Moved by Director Werb. And a second, please. Second. Seconded by Director Chester. I will open it up for discussion or questions or comments. Yes, I'm sorry, Director Holt, go ahead. I uh, just want to, uh, as chair of the policy committee, thank uh, Assistant Superintendent Gersich. Um, we had um, some live conversations um, around the student dress and appearance policy and um, really appreciate your willingness to go back and talk with staff and make sure that, you know, confirming that um, the language that the that the committee was discussing was uh, going to be in sync with um, the administrators. So um, really appreciate your legwork on that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate that. And, and it goes both ways. I appreciate the thought and consideration that's put into that, as well as the ability to take our time and to get that feedback and make sure we understand the system's impact of what we we're proposing. So thanks to you and the committee as well. Additional questions or comments? Um, I just have a question because um, my child will be very excited about being able to wear a hooded sweatshirt. <laughs> <laughs> um, how does that kind of thing get communicated so that, you know, it trickles down to all uh, levels like middle school, elementary? Yeah, so that's just something that we'll, we'll certainly let them know uh, if there's language currently in our handbooks. We're going to have to clean some of those things up. I think our principals have been um, kind of expecting this, and this is a policy that took some time through kind of the, the chain. So I think they're, they're prepared for this. And so it's, it's kind of a way to say I'm not, I'm not sure if enforcement has been as rigorous as perhaps it may have been before because there was at least an understanding that the policy committee have been supportive of this change dating back to, I think, June. Some of the other changes we've been talking about since then were not actually that particular piece, if that makes sense. 
Thanks. Mm -hmm. Additional questions or comments? Okay, hearing none, we will vote on the, the uh, motion in front of us. All those in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 Any in, not in favor, indicate by saying nay. Hearing none, the motion passes. And then uh, last agenda item under new business this evening is to approve on a first reading basis changes to policy 208, development, adoption, and implementation of policies. And this uh, presenting will be Dr. Battle. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chair Miller, directors of the board. After review from the policy committee, I bring forward uh, policy 208. The first revision you will see is in section two, general statement of policy, the removal of the word efficient and replaced by equitable. Uh, the second change is on 208-2 under section five, V, implementation of policy. C, um, superintendent and designees are responsible to keep the digital policies uh, current. As you know, we've had an updated web design, and so we do have a new link uh, to those digital policies. And also under D, we, the board adopted a uh, new policy, 634, electronic technologies, acceptable use policy um, that, uh, uh, replace the 524, so we've made that change. And then lastly, under cross-references, uh, our equity, access, and excellence in education policy 105 was added as a cross-reference. With that, I am asking the board uh, to approve on a first reading basis changes to policy 208, development, adoption, and implementation of policies. Thank you. I will take a motion for the recommendation in front of us. So moved. Moved by Director Connor and a second, please. Second. Seconded by Director Hume. Any uh, questions or comments or discussion on the matter on the motion in front of us? Seeing none, we will take a vote to approve the motion in front of us. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Uh, any not uh, in approval, please indicate by saying nay. Hearing none, the motion does pass. That brings us to the end of our agenda as uh, voted on for this evening, and therefore I will call us an adjournment. The time is 742.